This is Better Edge, a Northwestern medicine podcast for physicians. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner, Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and Division Director of Neurology at Regional One Health in Memphis, Tennessee. Today, two experts from Northwestern medicine, neurootologist Dr. Nicholas Hotch and neuroophthalmologist Dr. Nina Chirile are going to tell us what they learn by looking at the eyes of our patients with dizziness. Welcome, Drs. Hotch and Chirile. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, to get started, Dr. Hotch, tell us a little bit about the kinds of patients you see. Uh, who gets referred to you and uh, what kind of tests you do? Yeah, great question. Um, most of what I see is just patients who have the chief complaint of dizziness or vertigo, uh, anything along those lines. Um, so it's almost a just one or two chief complaints type of clinic that I end up seeing patients, uh, sometimes also patients with some abnormal eye movements. Um, what I do a lot is a pretty extensive history on these patients to get um, a lot of information about what types of things trigger their dizziness, how long does it last, what are the associated symptoms, and how do they actually themselves describe the symptoms that they have. And then there's some extra special testing that we do. Um, it depends a little bit on what history I gather from the patients. Um, but beyond the general neurological exam, I have a very close look at patients' eye movements and various um, circumstances. And then we use the video goggles, so the Frenzel goggles, to put on patients' eyes to take a very close look at their eye movements. Um, and then sometimes some extra vestibular testing, such as the video head impulse test, or I rely on some of my audiology colleagues to do things like caloric testing or VEMP testing, um, et cetera. Okay. Now, Dr. Chirile, uh, I heard eye movements mentioned uh, a few times. Is, is that where you come in? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Hotch and I work closely together. I'm a neuro-ophthalmologist. I treat the visual manifestations of neurologic disease. So that could be an anywhere in the central or peripheral nervous system. And there's a subset of patients with dizziness or vertigo who have um, vision problems that are contributing to their primary complaint of dizziness. So this could include things like ocular misalignment or double vision that could be affecting their depth perception um, or giving them a little bit of une uneasiness in certain directions of gaze. Um, abnormal eye movements, such as um, rhythmic eye movements like nystagmus, can cause the symptom of ocelopsia, which is the jumping of your visual environment. Um, and vision loss as well can contribute to um, uh, dizziness as a symptom. So both of us can kind of work together to address the different facets of dizziness that way. Okay, so, well... How about an example? Can you give me an example of a patient that uh, you saw recently whose eyes were wiggling around and, and you were able to figure out what it was and then you were able to make them better? Is that, does that ever happen? Um, I can go ahead with an example that um, uh, we have a large movement disorders division um, at Northwestern and we get referred lots of patients who have uh, degenerative cerebellar conditions that can cause um, nystagmus or that symptom of oscillopsia. Recently saw a patient with downbeat nystagmus, started a medication called alfampridine, and the patient actually had significant improvement in that symptom of oscillopsia and really improved their kind of gait dysfunction um, and a little bit of the dizziness feeling that they were having as well in the setting of their underlying neurodegenerative disease. Um, there are lots of other treatments, too, for double vision in particular. So um, sometimes a patient um, may describe dizziness It's a, as kind of a vague symptom, or but it's very gaze-evoked. It's only when I'm going down the stairs or when I'm trying to look down to read. Um, and a lot of those patients may actually have congenital nerve palsy, such as a fourth nerve palsy that's causing subtle double vision that they're not interpreting as such those patients are easily treatable with um, prison therapy or by one of our for business surgeon colleagues with uh, eye muscle surgery. 
All right, let's get back. I want some practical advice for uh, physicians. Is, is there an easy way to look at the eyes for a non-neuro-ophthalmologist and see abnormal eye movements and say, ooh, these abnormal eye movements are bad. <laughs> you better go see the neuro-ophthalmologist or, well, these abnormal eye movements are okay. Is there some way to differentiate benign from malignant or do, do all of these patients need a comprehensive evaluation? So I can start with that one. Um, I think I think the example that Dr. Trial had brought up of these patients with a downbeat nystagmus that does tend to be a bit of a red flag that there is something going on in the brain, probably the cerebellum. Um, it depends a little bit on the time course of the symptoms, is what I would say. So if this has probably been going on for a long time, slowly worsening symptoms over the course of months. It's not like there is some urgency to send this person to the emergency department now, but it is the type of person that you want to make sure that you get advanced neuroimaging on these patients as well as try to, you know, figure out, uh, you know, do a pretty thorough neurological exam looking for ataxia um, and brainstem signs on patients like this. I think probably as my rule of thumb, if you have somebody who has a spontaneous vertical nystagmus, whether it's upbeat or downbeat, or if they have a spontaneous torsional, so that means if you're looking at the eyes and you sort of see that they're just spontaneously twisting, that all of that is a red flag that there is something wrong going on in the brain stem or the cerebellum. And so it requires um, further evaluation. Would most of these patients get, say, an MRI of their brain as part of the workup? Yeah, that would be that would be my recommendation because you you always want to look for the possibility that there could be some sort of lesion, whether that is a demyelinating lesion, a slow growing tumor, um, et cetera, that could be uh, causing those symptoms. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what about you know when? I I'm a neurologist and I see a lot of uh, dizzy patients and frankly, it's often challenging to sort of pin it down. Of course, we do do a thorough history and neurologic exam, look for focal findings, any associated findings, do an MRI, but often uh, come up uh, empty handed. I would say more often than not. Uh, at that point, I say, well, I don't know, maybe it's inner ear, <laughs> something like that, the labyrinth. Is that a reasonable thing to say? So I, I can also answer that question, too, because uh, I think about inner ear stuff as a neurootologist or an otoneurologist, depending sure. on who you ask. Um, it is certainly a reasonable consideration. Um, the brain is still a possibility. I think that the big two diagnoses are BPPB or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, where sometimes even when you do a Dix-Hall pike, you just don't see any eye movements, but if you have a highly suggestive history, it's reasonable to assume that, send the patient to vestibular physical therapy. Maybe with physical therapy, they examine the patient a couple more times, and then suddenly the eye movements that are classically associated with BPPB show up. It's just that it could have been in remission at the time that you see the patient. But the other Big diagnosis that I would encourage everyone to think about would be vestibular migraines, which is just a very common thing that I see in these patients. They do not have to have headaches at the time that they're having dizziness. Um, it's very common for them to have a history of headaches that sound consistent with migraines, but with their episodes of dizziness, they may just have some associated kind of like sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound, maybe some nausea that sound a little bit migrainey. And they might have some classic migraine triggers such as stress induced, you know, um, some certain foods that can induce the symptoms, caffeine, alcohol, uh, or just not having had anything to eat. And so if you get a history like that, where you're noticing some migraine triggers here and there, um, you're noticing some associated migraine symptoms, then think at least think about the cellular migraine as a possibility. Oh, that's interesting. And Dr. Chirala, I suspect that migraine is in uh, your differential diagnosis as well. 
we see a lot of patients with visual disturbances associated with migraine. Um, they can have kind of mixed positive and negative phenomena. So, you know, the jagged wavy lines and colorful lines of fortification spectra or the glimmering uh, missing spot in their vision. It can be really alarming to patients um, when they don't have a name to it or an explanation for it. We certainly uh, want to make sure that we're not missing any ocular causes of visual symptoms, especially if it's just pure vision loss, which would be unusual for a migraine aura. That's certainly a diagnosis that's seen very frequently by neuroophthalmologists. Well, since there are so many of these patients with difficult to diagnose uh, symptoms of dizziness and difficult to treat, I think, uh, symptoms of dizziness, what do you do at Northwestern that's, that's special to help these patients? I guess I can get started on that too. I, I think some of it really is, it's helpful to just see someone who kind of sees these patients all day, every day for one thing. At the end of the day, you do get a little bit of a gestalt, I would say, when you see these patients um, for what could be going on. But that specialized testing is really important. Like when I put those Frenzel goggles on patients, um, in particular for the BPPV patients. And so I, you know, bring their heads back, do various positional maneuvers. It's just much easier to see subtle nystagmus patterns that otherwise, I think when you don't have that sort of equipment, you know, you, you try to put the patient in the Dick's Hall pipe position or a supine roll position and you, and you can't see any nystagmus, um, it really helps in actually solidifying the diagnosis by seeing that classic eye movement pattern. You, you can also, uh, with some of this testing, test for some of these inner ear causes, as you said, Dr. Wilner, um, to actually also prove that it could very well be an inner ear cause that's causing these symptoms. So um, a, little, a little this, a little that. And of course, some of these patients are very complex, and so I rely on uh, some of my other colleagues, you know, a lot of, a lot of migraine patients, they have these associated visual symptoms. And so always in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, you know, should I, should we be doing a little bit more of a thorough look at these patients? And so I ask, I asked Dr. Trial to see those types of patients and it may be that there's multiple things going on, you know, uh, it's not always Occam's razor when it comes to these patients where everything can be explained by one thing. Sometimes, you know, a patient can have as many diseases as he or she pleases. I'd like to add and that I totally agree with Dr. Hotch. The optimal management of a lot of patients, especially patients with dizziness, um, requires getting to the right diagnosis to target the right treatment. And sometimes that requires specialized testing and evaluations with subspecialists. I wanted to ask one more thing. You had, uh, Dr. Hotch, you mentioned earlier physical therapy. Um, so it sounds like you have a, a, a comprehensive program where there's a diagnosis and, of course, you recommend treatment and physical therapy when needed. What, what do physical therapists do with dizzy patients? Yeah, so that's a great question. And it somewhat depends on the diagnosis. I think that vestibular physical therapists are excellent at treating BPPV in all of its forms. So when you have the otoconia kind of running loose in the inner ear, it can go into a variety of places. The classic example is the posterior canal, you know, where people get, um, you know, seconds to minutes of dizziness when they tilt their head up or down or when they sit up or lay down or when they roll over in bed. Um, and so physical therapists are really good at using the canalith repositioning maneuvers to move the crystals back into to the utricle where they came from. Um, but the other big disease categories are in unilateral vestibular weakness, um, which has a variety of different diagnoses. So the, the classic example there is that somebody who has an acute onset vestibular neuritis uh, physical therapy is incredibly helpful for treating these patients. Um, they can do these gaze stabilization exercises where they have them practice using their vestibular system uh, over and over and over again so that the brain can adapt um, and can learn how to live with that new deficit from a vestibular neuritis. 
but it's not just vestibular neuritis. It's also tumors, vestibular schwannomas, that type of thing that impinge on the nerve um, and can lead to some vestibular weakness as well that they can be very helpful with. Uh, and those are the two big categories in which physical therapy has been proven in many studies to be helpful. But also in my experience, some patients who have things like vestibular migraine, um, you know, they their dizziness is often triggered by very complex sensory environments. So they classically describe, you know, going to a grocery store or department store and there's so much activity going on that they get dizzy and so learning how to cope with uh, these environments can also be helpful and so many vestibular physical therapists who are familiar with that diagnosis can help them learn to adapt and habituate to these more complex environments so there's a lot of ways in which i work with vestibular physical therapy to help these patients and oftentimes at northwestern we have many of those physical therapists throughout all of Chicago land. And, and I frequently message with them so that we can co-treat and help these patients. Well, that's terrific. Well, that wraps up our discussion on the neurootologic and neuroophthalmologic approaches to dizziness with Drs. Hotch and Chirail. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. To refer your patient or for more information, head on over to our website at breakthroughsforphysicians.nm.org slash neuro to get connected with one of our providers. And that concludes this episode of Better Edge, a Northwestern medicine podcast for physicians. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Thanks for listening.